All right, so uh, let's get started then. So um, we'll start with some uh, administration. Um, first, uh, scribe notes for classes are starting to appear on Piazza. So um, they're all linked from the lecture outline page. Uh, so if you go there, they'll uh, hopefully help you with studying. Um, homework two uh, is going to be out soon, either uh, later today or early tomorrow. So um, look for that on Piazza. Uh, there's a recitation tomorrow. Um, Anthony's going to run it. He's going to cover uh, some of the online questions that people had trouble with, uh, which seems like uh, you know, a good thing to go to if you had trouble with any of the online questions. Um, he's also going to talk about convexity uh, and gradient descent. So if those are topics that uh, over the past few lectures you had any trouble with, um, I recommend that you come to the recitation. Uh, let's see. So um, on the topic of questions that people had trouble with, uh, this was probably the biggest one. So I figured I'd mention it at the uh, beginning of the full class. So this was the question about how many parameters are there in a Gaussian Bayes classifier, right? And you can see here's the histogram of answers that people gave to the question. Um, so anywhere between two and 2,000 um, could, be, could be the case. Um, luckily, the, uh, the largest bar there is the correct answer. So congratulations to everybody who got that. Um, so here's the correct calculation. Um, for each class, so this was with a 10-dimensional feature vector. Uh, for each class, there were 10 parameters for the mean. There's a covariance matrix, which is 10 by 10, but it's symmetric. So not every one of the parameters is independently changeable. Uh, so the formula for the number of independent parameters in a symmetric matrix is d times d plus 1 over 2, so 55 in this case. Uh, 65 times 2 is 130. And then the thing that seemed to give everybody trouble as well, there's also a parameter for what's the prior probability of the classes before you see the features, right? What's the prior probability of the, that uh, y is equal to 1, right? So that's 130 plus 1 is 131. Uh, if you look at some of these, um, if you look at some of these uh, features, uh, some of these answers, you can see there are a few. Um, uh, well, I'm guessing what mistakes people made, but um, uh, I have some pretty decent guesses. So, uh, if you only got the mean vectors, you would get 20 parameters, right? If you got the means in the prior class probability, you'd get 21. Uh, if you thought that the variant, the covariance matrix had to be diagonal you would get 40 parameters, 20 per class, or 41 if you add the, um, uh, if you add the class probability. Um, the ones that are in the order of thousands, that's if you um, accidentally used the formula for a discrete probability distribution instead of a continuous one, the Gaussian one, right? So with 10 features binary, there would be uh, 1024 probabilities, 1023 of which you could change at once. Uh, and so some permutation of that uh, doubled for the two classes, right, will get you these answers um, like 2046 or 1023, right? So um, did I cover everybody's mistakes, more or less? Yeah. Are these people's first answers or second answers? These are all answers. Right, so uh, if you tried it 10 times, you're counted 10 times in this histogram. Um, I could make another histogram for the final answer. What's your final answer? Um, but I actually thought this was more interesting. Um, anyway, there were, I, I was certainly interested to see all of the ways, all of the different uh, answers that people gave, right? There, if you can reverse engineer the route to, eat to a lot of them, which is kind of interesting. It's a nice machine learning problem. Uh, all right. Well, I believe the 220 came in because we didn't say Oh, design. that's right. Yes. So during the design of the question, we made a mistake, uh, which gives uh, if you forget that covariance matrices have to be symmetric, right? The uh, you'll get that it's uh, 100 parameters per covariance matrix. So you would get 221, right? And a lot of people did that as well. All right. Any other any other cool mistakes that people have made on this one? Um, I don't know what two is. Um, maybe if you believe that your Gaussian distributions are 
um, completely pre-specified and you only have to learn the two class probabilities and forget that they have to sum to one. But I'm guessing here. <laughs> Unless somebody wants to fess up to that answer and tell us why. Yeah, I didn't think so. Um, so, uh, right. So back to, uh, back to new stuff. Um, there's another set of online questions out, so um, uh, it's a little bit shorter because it's covering fewer lectures, so um, you know, hit our servers for that and uh, let us know if you run into problems. All right, so um, at the end of last lecture we were talking about uh, discriminant functions, right? So a perceptron is a linear discriminant function, right? It's a function of your examples uh, that's linear in the features of the example, such that if it's above zero, you're one class. If it's below zero, you're another class, right? And I gave some examples last time of where you might want a nonlinear discriminant function. Uh, here's a nice prettily MATLAB plotted one, right? If you have the blue class versus the red class, probably the best discriminant looks something like the figure on the uh, right. Right, where it's sort of a, a, a long skinny positive class and a sort of spread out um, negative class. Uh, and so we were talking about how you, how you might want to learn such a thing. Right? So you could have quadratic discriminants, um, uh, Chebyshev polynomial discriminants, right? anything that you want. Uh, this one happens to be radial basis, Gaussian radial basis functions. Um, right, so we talked about feature transforms, right? And if you remember, uh, right, so the, the um, top left picture here is the linear discriminant. And if you do a feature transform um, from the bottom right picture where all of the examples have just one feature, horizontal position, to the um, top right picture where I've added a horizontal position squared as a feature, right? The things that were, uh, that are linear in that top right picture wind up being nonlinear decision boundaries, nonlinear discriminant functions uh, in the bottom picture, right? And so if you, do, um, if you do that sort of feature transform, you can let yourself uh, learn some much more complicated uh, decision boundaries. Thank you very much. Thanks. So, um, right. Uh, and so that's feature vectors. What if we want to think of the whole discriminant function as a parameter, right? So uh, we hinted at this at the end of last uh, lecture. So what do I mean by thinking of the, of the discriminant function as a parameter, right? The function itself I'm thinking of as my parameter vector. And so one way to think about it would be that I could just sample the function at a bunch of discrete points. So um, in this example, there are 31 points that I sampled the function at. Uh, so I'm thinking of my function as being a 31-dimensional vector, and so I can take, you know, um, I can take this function uh, here. Uh, interesting. I can take. Um, there we go. Uh, there. So I can take this function here, uh, which is the. Um, Right, this is a 131 dimensional vector. Here's another 31 dimensional vector. Add them together and plot them as a function, right, and get another 31 dimensional vector. And so the way I'm adding them together, right, is I'm taking, let's say, the fourth point over here and the fourth point over there, and I add them up and I get this fourth point over here, right? So this is just a representation of a vector. Um, and now what I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to suggest is that um, uh, we blow our minds and imagine that the number of sample points goes to infinity, uncountably many dimensions, uh, and that we think of these as uncountable dimensional vectors. And what are the consequences of doing that? Uh, well, sit tight and we'll go through them for the rest of the lecture. So, um, oops. Oh, so I should say, what happens if we just directly try to learn the um, perceptron uh, with, um, with these features, right? So this is this function <clears throat> to vector of samples. You can think of this as being a feature transform where um, the features are something like, uh, something like this. You have, um, right, so here's my um, coordinate axes like that, and I'll have a feature function which is 0, 0, 0, and then inside a tiny bin it'll be 1, 
right, and zero for that. And then I'll have another one which is zero, 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 and then in another bin it'll be one, right, and it'll go like that, right? And so uh, in my 31 dimensional example, I had 31 of these bins, and I had a function that was a constant one inside the bin and a constant zero outside the bin, right? And so if we run the perceptron with features that look like that, uh, on every mistake, we're going to take one bin's value and we're going to alter it, right? Because every example has a single bin set to one and the rest to zero. And so when we add that example, we're just altering the value in a single bin. Um, so um, that's going to be horrible, right? Because we're going to never generalize. Like suppose we had a million bins, right? We would wind up with, um, uh, you know, we'd never see the same example twice, or it would take on the average of like a uh, square root of a million trials before we even saw two examples the same, right? Um, and so it would, you know, we'd very, very slowly learn the value in each bin and generalization would be bad. Um, and if you look at our bounds, right, our bounds say that um, they don't depend on the dimensionality, right? So something, is, something weird is happening here. If you look at the, what they do depend on is the norm of the optimal discriminant function. So if you take a function and you discretize it into 10 bins, its norm is going to be on the order of square root of 10, right? If you discretize it into a million bins, its norm is going to be on the order of square root of a million. If you discretize it into uncountably many bins, its norm is going to be on the order of square root of uncountable infinity, which is still pretty darn big. Um, and so uh, we're going to get no generalization guarantee whatsoever. Right? So that's what's going wrong. Um, and so we need a new idea. And what is that new idea? So to get there, what we're going to do is look at what does the margin mean after the feature transform. And we're going to try and get a better, uh, a better idea of margin. So um, to do that, we're going to give you yet another interpretation of the margin. I'm sure uh, the past three that we've given you aren't enough. Um, so we start from the fact that margin gamma means that um, uh, ui.w is bigger than or equal to 1 for all i, and um, that the uh, norm of w is 1 over gamma, right? Um, and so then what we do is we think, OK, so let's draw that picture, right? We have some uh, decision boundary going through the origin. Uh, and this is, I'll draw its norm, uh, normal w, right? And we'll have some example over here that's a positive class. We'll have some example over here, right, that are negative class. Um, and if I take this example, and let's suppose that I move it by a distance delta, Right? Uh, so let's draw a circle of radius delta around that example. Right? So if I take um, uh, delta equal to, uh, well, let's say delta is uh, not, um, not equal to, but um, uh, delta is strictly less than gamma, right? then I can't change the class of that example. Right? Previously, it was. Um, uh, previously, it was classified correctly with margin gamma. If I move it a distance uh, less than gamma, I can't cross the decision boundary. And so what the margin is saying is that we've learned a classifier that's somehow robust to uh, corrupted examples. Right? If I move my example by a distance of no more than gamma, then it's still going to remain correctly classified. And I can do that to all of my examples at once. Right? And these ones that are farther away from the boundary also can't cross the boundary. Okay. So now, after the feature transform, this gives us a way to interpret the margin, right? The margin is, um, uh, it's a guarantee. If I perturb the features, uh, if I have margin gamma and I perturb the features of my example by no more than gamma, then uh, everything's going to remain correctly classified, right? So this is sort of a nice way to think about it um, uh, in, term, in, in terms of feature space. And so what I would like to do uh, in function space is say the same thing. Um, when I make a small change to my examples, I'm not going to uh, cause them to be misclassified if they originally had a large margin. 
Now, if you, uh, if you go back to the bin-based representation, that doesn't work, right? Because uh, here's, you know, if I have two examples arbitrarily close together, right? This one has one bin turned on, this one has a different bin turned on, their distance is square root of two no matter whether they're close or far, right? They're just gonna differ have in two positions and they'll differ by one in each position, so their dis distance is square root of two. So small changes in the example don't cause what we would think of as small changes in the features, and so we're getting bad generalization, okay? Okay, so. Um, so what are we gonna do? So let's um, start with the algorithm that we know works, a plain old ordinary linear perceptron, and try and view it in function space, right? So on uh, each mistake x, y, right, uh, we have something that looks like, right, our uh, weight vector, um, our weight vector uh, w gets replaced by w plus ui, right? And so, um, that's going to change our discriminant function, right? So um, we have our uh, discriminant function was f old of x prime is equal to w old uh, dot x prime, right? Uh, and now that goes to a new discriminant function, which is f new of x prime is equal to uh, w new, which is w old plus ui dot x prime, right? Uh, and so thinking about that in um, function space, right, this is uh, f new of x prime is equal to f old of x prime plus uh, ui dot x prime, right? And so what does that mean? That means that in function space, I'm taking the old function and I'm adding to it another function, right? This is a function of x, uh, x prime, uh, right? And so this is uh, another way to write it is uh, yi xi dot x prime, right? And so the larger the dot product between x prime and x, the more I'm changing the function at x prime, right? And the more negative, the more I'm changing it in the opposite direction, right? Uh, and that's for a positive training example, and the sign is flipped if I flip the sign of yi, right? So I make it more negative uh, if I get a negative example that's similar to me, right? And so um, why does the perceptron use this particular update? Well, uh, intuitively you can think of a dot product as a measure of similarity, right? It's like the angle between two vectors. Right? Uh, and so if you have a large dot product, you're pointing in more or less the same direction. If you have zero dot product, you're pretty, pretty much orthogonal. Uh, and if you have negative dot product, you're pointing in opposite directions, right? So we're thinking of the dot product as a measure of similarity here. Uh, and so um, our problem, right, is that in the bin-wise perceptron, no bin is like any other bin. They're all orthogonal. Their features are orthogonal to each other. So what we're going to need to do is change what our idea of like is, right, which means changing our dot product. Uh, and so let's, let's set about doing that. Um, okay, so, um, whoops. So, um, the idea for doing that is something called a kernel. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, for each x, for each point x, I'm going to pick a function, uh, which I will call k sub x of x prime, right? And we'll call that the kernel. Um, uh, it's actually, let's even be more specific, we'll call it the kernel at x, OK? So. Um, for example, we could pick k sub x of x prime to be equal to x dot x prime, right? And then if we did that, um, this would give us back the, the, uh, the regular perceptron. Um, and, but in general, we get to choose our notion of similarity, right? So k sub x of x prime tells us how similar is x prime to x, okay? Uh, 
Uh, and so another good example, one that you might see commonly, would be uh, k sub x of x prime uh, is equal to e to the minus x minus x prime squared over 2 sigma squared, right? Um, so this is a function that looks like uh, this, right? Uh, it's centered at x, right? And if x, uh, you know, x prime could be, let's say, uh, whoops, that's not a prime. Uh, x prime could be right here, right? In which case it would be sort of similar to x, or it could be over here, in which case it would be not similar at all to x, right? Um, and so now then, um, what we're thinking of doing uh, is with this, um, yeah, so we're thinking of using this kernel to measure similarity. Uh, and in particular, small perturbations to an example are those for which k sub x of x prime is large, right? So, um, right, so k sub x of x prime big is going to be the same as saying x is uh, similar uh, x prime, OK? Um, and so, for example, for this Gaussian kernel here, right, similar means uh, roughly that you're within the width of the Gaussian, OK? And then given that kernel, uh, we can define what's called the kernel perceptron algorithm. Um, which is on every mistake uh, x, y, we're going to take our discriminant function and we're going to update it by adding the kernel centered at our mistake, right? Uh, and then the sign of that will be the, uh, the sign that makes you more likely to classify that example correctly in the future, OK? Uh, and so what that means, right, that's written as functions. Um, but we can, we can also write it as um, uh, just what happens to each argument, right? Um, it's going to be uh, f of x prime plus uh, y times kx of x prime, right? Um, and so uh, in an infinite dimensional function space, um, how are we going to store this f that we're calculating? Anybody have thoughts about that, right? You can't just... Um, you know, put it in, uh, in RAM if there's an infinite amount of it. Any thoughts? Yeah. Um, close, right. So, so what, I'm, what I would suggest to store it is just to store the list of all of your mistakes so far, right? Um, so just store just the, y, the yi's and the xi's for which you made, made a mistake. Right? And so your representation grows over time. As you make more mistakes, you get a bigger and bigger representation. But it's finite. right? So we're storing an infinite thing in our computer with a finite amount of data, right? which is good. Um, and, so, uh, right? and so once we do that, we store the list of all of our mistakes like that. Uh, and we evaluate it by taking the sum over all uh, i, which are mistakes. Uh, of yi uh, k uh, uh, sub xi of x prime, right? And so we can evaluate this function at any new x prime. Uh, and our data structure is very simple, right? It's just a list of past mistakes. Um, and like I mentioned before, uh, if, um, so suppose that we pick k uh, x prime of x to be equal to x prime dot x, right? Then, um, what are, then what's going to happen? Uh, we have this sum right there is going to wind up uh, being, uh, if we evaluate it at um, x prime, right, uh, this will wind up being sum over i, y i, uh, xi dot x prime, right? And we can put the parentheses here, right? And so this will be our weight vector w, right? That's the ordinary perceptron algorithm. And so with this kernel, 
we've reproduced the ordinary perceptron algorithm. But with other kernels, we get different algorithms. Right? So if you use the Gaussian RBF kernel, for example, you get an algorithm that we haven't discussed until today. All right, so does the algorithm work? Right? That's the first question you should be asking. Um, does it do anything interesting? Uh, and spoiler, yes, sometimes. Um, and basically what's going to wind up happening is that we'll need some assumptions on what this kernel uh, at x looks like. But they're going to be pretty simple assumptions, which is nice. Um, and uh, it's only the analysis that's going to be complicated. Right? So it keeps me, keeps me off the streets right? explaining this sort of stuff. Uh, but the algorithm turns out to be pretty simple. Um, I, if you're interested in, uh, right, if the next, let's say, five to ten slides really pique your interest, I put a link to a book on the course website, uh, Kreisig's Functional Analysis. It's really cool stuff. It's way outside the scope of this course. But if it's the sort of thing you're interested in, that's a good place to start. Um, right, so. Uh, the, before we get started, I wanted to just say how amazing this is in some sense, right? So we're making a few really simple assumptions about this kernel function. And they're going to guarantee that we can successfully optimize over an infinite dimensional space of functions, right? Even with our you know, measly finite computers. And to me, this is kind of amazing, right? And the algorithm turns out to be very simple, too. Um, and what's even more amazing is that the same justification that I'm going to give you for the, uh, for the kernel perceptron algorithm is going to wind up working for a whole bunch of other kernel machine learning algorithms, uh, which are you know, all the rage these days. Um, so, uh, so with that as uh, motivation, let's, uh, let's get started with the uh, analysis. All right. So, um, right. So what I want to think about is uh, I want to think about what does this idea of an infinite dimensional vector space actually mean, right? And so uh, if you remember vector spaces like RD, right, uh, the main thing about them was that they had, um, uh, you know, vectors in them and you could add these vectors and multiply them by four and do, do all sorts of stuff, right? So what I'm going to do is uh, talk about what's called an abstract vector space or a general vector space, which is just a set of, uh, a set H whose objects we're going to call vectors. Uh, and the reason we're going to call them vectors is that we have, uh, uh, is that we have uh, an addition like F plus G, right, and a scalar multiplication scalar multiplication, a times f, which work on elements of h and give you other elements of h. Uh, and these addition and multiplication operators, they make sense in the sense that, um, for example, addition is associative and commutative. Scalar multiplication distributes over addition. Uh, if you multiply a function by zero, you get the zero. If you multiply a vector by zero, you get the zero vector, right? So, sort of the standard assumptions that you might be, uh, uh, standard properties you might be familiar with from ordinary, you know, R to the d type vector spaces. I'm just going to assume that they're they're true for my uh, for my general vector space. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, the elements of this general vector space and I'm going to identify them with functions, right? So I'm going to have some example space E, right? And the, uh, if f is in H, that means that f is a function from examples to uh, real numbers, right? Uh, and I could just arbitrarily assign these functions willy-nilly to the vectors, but I'm not going to allow that. I'm going to require that I do it in a way that makes sense. And what does make sense mean? It means that uh, it's compatible with the vector space operations of addition and scalar multiplication. So for example, if I take the function af plus g and evaluate it at a point x, right, that should be equal to a times f of x plus g of x. Right? And so uh, I'm allowed now to um, take my 
my set of functions from examples to the reals, right? An example is something like an email or a flower whose petal length I measured, right? Uh, and uh, I have functions from the examples to the real numbers. Uh, and I just have to assign them to these vectors of the abstract vector space in a way that makes the standard vector space operations make sense. Okay? So uh, now nothing that I've said requires that it be finite dimensional. And in fact, there are tons of really interesting infinite dimensional vector spaces. Right? And in particular, I'm looking at an infinite dimensional vector space of functions. So specifically for the uh, kernel perceptron, I want to make a function space that will let me analyze the functions I might get while running the kernel perceptron. Right? So what are the discriminant functions we could get from a kernel perceptron? They're going to be something that looks like the, uh, the sum uh, over um, some set of mistakes i of a weight uh, a i times um, k sub x i of x, right? So it's going to be a finite sum of uh, kernel functions centered at points. And the kernel functions each have a weight, which could be plus 1 or minus 1. But we're going to let it be a general real number in this, uh, in this case, right? And so um, that set of functions, this here, is called the span of the kernel functions, k sub xi. Um, and what we're actually going to do, uh, for technical reasons which I'll uh, tell you about offline if you're interested, uh, we're going to include also infinite sums. So we're going to allow, right, this is sum from i equals 1 to n. We're also going to allow sum, <coughs> excuse me, from i equals 1 to infinity of a i f, uh, sorry, not f, but uh, k, uh, a i k x i of x, right, with the um, uh, if we have pointwise convergence. In other words, if at every x the value of that function, the value of that infinite sum actually converges at every x and is some you know, finite number which we'll call the value of that sum at x. Right? Um, and so that's called the completion of the span of the kernels. Right? And so this is going to be my function space. Right? It's going to be all of the functions that I can get by adding together uh, kernel functions centered at each one of the uh, centered at data points, um, possibly infinitely many of them as long as the sum converges, right? And um, why did I pick this particular function space? Right, it's the set of things that I could potentially get by just adding together a bunch of kernel functions, which are the operations that I'm doing in the kernel perceptron algorithm. All right, so. Um, we want to talk about the convergence of the kernel perceptron algorithm. Talk about convergence, you need to know when things are getting close to one another. So we need to defi define a notion of similarity. Um, we've already defined a notion of similarity between points, right? We defined um, uh, k sub x of x prime to be our notion of similarity between points. And so what I'm going to do is take that notion of similarity between points and use it to define a notion of similarity between functions. And once we have similarity between functions, we can ask ourselves, is the kernel perceptron converging to something? Right? Is it getting more and more similar to some particular function? So um, I'll do this in three steps. Uh, if we have, so, um, we have the functions k sub x and k sub x prime, right? These are very simple functions. They're just kernels centered at one point. And I can ask myself, what is the similarity between those two functions, right? Uh, and I'm going to say that it is, uh, so I'm going to introduce a new notation. The similarity between uh, kx and kx prime. Uh, Right, that's uh, the little angle brackets are going to denote similarity, and I'm going to show later that it's very much like a dot product. Um, so that is going to be defined to be um, just 
kx of x prime, right? So in other words, in order to tell how similar two kernel functions are, I ask how similar are the points that they're centered at. Seems like a very reasonable thing to do, right? And now I just extend it to, uh, you know, dot products are supposed to be linear, so I extend it to the rest of the space by linearity and continuity. Um, and so if I have two functions, uh, f and f prime, which are just some of ai kxi and some of ai prime kxi prime, their similarity is going to be uh, the sum over i and j of ai times aj times the similarity between uh, kxi and k. Uh, x, sorry, k, uh, x prime i, a prime j, sorry, let me read this again. So we have uh, coefficients are a prime, and, are a and a prime, right? So I'll have uh, a i and a prime j, and I'll have the points are x i and x i prime, so I'll have k x i and k x i prime, uh, x j prime, right? summed over all j, right? So this is just what would happen if I expanded the double sum, right? Took it out of the dot product. Um, and I'm just going to define that this is the dot product between, um, between f and f prime, right? I guess I should say inner product instead of dot product, because people usually reserve dot product for the one that's on finite dimensional real vector spaces. Um, so we'll call it an inner product. All right, um, and so that's the definition, right? So I've defined uh, a notion of similarity, uh, an inner product, which I'm denoting with a little angle brackets, uh, and I defined it by first looking at the, the kernel functions and then extending it to the, to the rest of functions by uh, linearity and continuity, okay? So um, the question you should be asking yourself is, is this thing that I've defined a valid inner product? What does it mean to be a valid inner product? Um, does it satisfy the usual things we, we like from dot products, right? It should be linear in each argument. It should be symmetric if we change the order of the arguments. It should be, uh, if we take f dot f, it should be bigger than or equal to zero. It should only be equal to zero if f is the zero function, right? And so uh, the answer to uh, does it, uh, whoops, um, the answer to uh, does it satisfy the, uh, these problems is a definite maybe. Um, so this is where the assumptions on the similarity on the kernel function come in, right? And so it turns out, uh, I'm not going to prove this, it turns out that if we assume uh, kx of x prime is equal to kx prime of x, right? That's symmetry. Uh, that will guarantee that the inner product is symmetric. Um, and then the other assumption that I'm going to make is what's called, uh, it has a bunch of names. It's called positive type. It's called Mercer's condition. And it's called positive semi-definiteness. Uh, but what it means is that if I take, um, a bunch of points, x1 to xn, and I look at the matrix uh, k, the matrix whose uh, ij element is k uh, x i of xj, right, over all i and j, right? If that matrix uh, is always is guaranteed to be positive semi-definite, then that's equivalent uh, that's just going to be defined to be equivalent to it, uh, the kernel being a positive type or Mercer or PSD kernel. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go through the, the math required to show that these are the right assumptions is out of the scope of this course. Uh, it's pretty interesting, so if you want to uh, if you want to uh, find out about it, I can give you references offline. Um, but let's just make these assumptions. Uh, and if those assumptions are satisfied, it turns out that that inner product that I just defined on functions is actually an inner product, right? It satisfies all of the usual axioms of, of inner product that we wanted. Okay. <laughs>
So um, just to recap, right, what we did was we started with this um, guess at how we wanted to generalize the perceptron algorithm. We put in these kernels centered at data points in order to, um, in order to put in a notion of similarity between data points. And now we're analyzing um, a space of functions that represents where the kernel perceptron algorithm could get. And we've just made this space of functions and uh, shown that it's nice in a few ways. Uh, in particular, it, it's a vector space. It's a vector space of functions in a way that matches up between function evaluation and vector space properties. And in fact, it's an inner product space, right? In other words, it has, it has an inner product on it and the inner product makes sense. Okay, so this is getting to be more and more like our familiar um, uh, notion of a uh, uh, familiar notion of a vector space. And it's going to get even more like it uh, in a few slides. But before then, I wanted to show you a couple of interesting and uh, well, one interesting and maybe somewhat bizarre property, um, which is the. Uh, it's about evaluating the function at a point, okay? Um, so what happens if I evaluate the function f at a point? Well, um, just by uh, definition, it's supposed to be the sum over all i of a i uh, k x i of x, right? Um, and so uh, we have uh, defined that that's equal to k of um, xi comma x, right? Um, actually, I guess we haven't defined that so far. I'm going to define this notion, notation k of xi comma x. Um, uh, so, but what we, what we have done uh, so far is um, we have defined that that is equal to the inner product between k sub xi and k sub x, right? Um, and so now, because the inner product is linear, I can pull uh, the inner product outside the sum, right? So we have f of x is equal to now the inner product between sum of um, sum over i of a i k x i. Uh, sorry, that's k sub x sub i uh, with k sub x, right? And so um, in particular, this here is the representation of f, right? Like that. And so what I've shown is that to evaluate a function at a point, you take the inner product between that function and the kernel at that point, right? So that's kind of interesting, right? It gives us uh, a, a nice way to manipulate the functions and, and evaluate them at points if we need to. Um, this property is uh, somewhat bizarre. It takes a little while to get your head around, but it's also really useful. Um, it's called uh, the reproducing kernel property um, for reasons that I don't really want to get into. I never really thought they were very good reasons, but the name is shrouded in history. We're stuck with it at this point. So this is called the reproducing kernel property. Okay. Um, yeah. Reproducing kernel property. So, um, just remember that for now, and we'll get back to uses of it in, uh, in a bit. But um, now I want to go and um, show that, uh, go and, and make this, this uh, vector space now even behave a little bit more like um, uh, ordinary real valued vector spaces. So we had an inner product, right? Uh, and from that inner product, we can actually define a norm. And the norm looks like this, right? The norm of f squared is just going to be defined to be equal to the dot product between f and itself, right? And so that's the way we would define norm in um, ordinary Euclidean you know, 
r to the d vector spaces. Uh, and we're going to extend that definition here. And it is actually a valid norm. You can show that it satisfies like the triangle inequality, the Cauchy-Schwartz uh, formula, all of that sort of stuff. Um, but now, this really gets back to uh, our notion of similarity, right? So um, we're going to say, uh, or uh, convergence even, even better, right? So we're going to say that if the norm of fi minus f converges to 0, then fi is converging to f. Right? So, uh, that's going to be the same as fi converging to f. Right? So now we have a notion of convergence in this space. Uh, and in fact, you can go back and show that uh, this is consist you know, it's compatible with all of our definitions so far, so that, for example, all Cauchy sequences converge, um, which is nice. Uh, but it also goes back to our idea, our intuitive idea of similarity. What we mean then by a small change to an example is a change that has small norm, right, in this uh, function space, right? So if the norm of kx minus kx prime is small, then uh, we're going to say it's a small change to the example. Um, and uh, similarly, for example, um, if a function has small norm, we'll say it's close to zero. If the difference between two functions has small norm, we'll say they're close to each other. Um, and if it's big, we'll say they're very different. Uh, so for example, if you look at the Gaussian RBF kernel, right? So for, uh, for the Gaussian RBF, right, we have that the norm of kx minus k x prime, right? That's just going to satisfy, it'll be the usual formula. It'll be kx comma kx, right? kx inner product kx minus 2 uh, kx with kx prime plus uh, kx prime with kx prime. Whoops, that should be uh, not a like that. Right? And this here, right, that's e to the minus 0, which is 1, right? So it's e to the minus difference between the two arguments squared. So that's 1. This is also 1. And then, uh, so this is going to be equal to 2 minus 2kx two of x prime, right? And so, like I said before, if kx of uh, uh, x prime is close to 1, then the, um, uh, the distance is going to be close to 0. And if it's close to 0, the distance will be close to 2, right? And so uh, we have a scale between 0 and 2 where 0 means very close to each other and 2 means far enough apart that we don't generalize from one to the other. OK? Was that a? I'm sorry? Should there be a square on the Yes, you're right. There should be a square. Thank you for keeping me honest. Um, all right. It was in my notes, but it didn't make it through my pen. Um, all right. And so now we've defined this norm, right? And with all of our other um, definitions, we can prove a theorem, but I'm going to state the theorem somewhat informally, so the word theorem is in quotes. Um, the space of functions we've defined is reasonable in a certain sense. And it turns out that every reasonable, in this sense, space of functions can be defined the way we just did. In other words, we take uh, a kernel function, we check that the kernel function is symmetric and positive semi-definite, and we take the completion of the span of those kernel functions. Uh, and then we define inner product and norm on them the way we just did. Yeah. Uh, no, it is not. Because I'm wondering if that uh, reproduction here would hold if they weren't. Uh, right. So um, an example, uh, you can get finite dimensional function spaces if you have, uh, so here's a kernel, right? I calculate a set of features from my points, and then I do the dot product between those features, right? And if I calculate k features, then the vector space at the end I'm going to get is no more than k dimensional. Right? And so if I take any k plus 1 points, um, uh, 
then they'll, their feature vectors, their kernels, were not, will not be uh, linearly independent. Um, and the reproducing property will still hold. Uh, but that's a, that's a really good question. Right? So um, uh, reasonable here, if you want to make this into an actual theorem instead of a quote theorem unquote, right? reasonable here means uh, that, uh, it, uh, that our function space uh, is a uh, reproducing kernel. Repro, oh my, I can't spell today. Reproducing kernel. Hilbert space, uh, space, right? Which is affectionately known by the acronym RKHS and is one of the least pleasant words to say in machine learning, uh, at least one of the least pleasant common words, but uh, that's what it is, right? And so what we've just done is define this thing called a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Uh, and reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces are important because they behave really a lot like ordinary finite dimensional vector spaces that you're familiar with. They're used in a ton of machine learning algorithms. And they're going to let us work with machine learning algorithms over infinite dimensional function spaces. All right. So, uh, so this is a good place maybe to stop and ask for questions, right? So I've just taken you through uh, an introduction to functional analysis, which is a subject of many 200-page textbooks in 10 slides. So your minds can be spinning a little bit right now. Uh, but let's, let's, get, uh, let's get questions. Right? Like, why did I do this? Yeah. That's correct. The function that we get out of the kernel perceptron is going to be a discriminant function. We check for each new point by evaluating the discriminant function and testing its sign. All right? Yeah. So why do you say it's the least positive term? Oh, just because it's hard to pronounce. RKHS, or reproducing kernel Hilbert space, takes a long time to say. Why is it not a pleasant term in machine learning? Um, it's very, it's very important. I would say, you know, some non, you know, some non-negligible percentage of all papers published in, let's say, ICML and NIPS have have some RKHS in them somewhere. Um, yeah. And now you said that on each incorrect uh, classification, we're going to adjust the function by adding the kernel of the. That's right. Multiplied by the sign, multiplied by the class of the example, right? So, so on each. Uh, on each mistake, we update the kernel. The, we update the discriminant function by adding, either by adding or subtracting the kernel at the point. And we add it if the point was positive, uh, was supposed to be positive, and we subtract it if the point was supposed to be negative. Is there, is there going to be a reason why that's obvious? It doesn't seem so intuitive. Um, well, so like if you think about. Think about a concrete example, like a Gaussian radial basis function, right? If you add the kernel centered at a point, you make the discriminant function more positive at that point, meaning you're more likely to classify it positive in the future. Same way, if you subtract it, you make it more negative, you're more likely to classify it correctly in the future. You had a? Um, I missed the, I saw where you weighted it by the A, but mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see where you multiplied by the class. Was the A the class? Or? That's right. So, so in general, uh, in our uh, RKHS of functions, it can be any weights AI. For the ones that come from the perceptron, the weights are always going to be the class labels. Okay, so it'll still be the same uh, um, positive and negative with the class, or in the binary case, right? That's right. This, so this is all in the binary case. It's all going to be positive and negative. You can make a multi-class perceptron, uh, but I wanna, don't want to introduce that at the same time as infinite dimensional perceptrons. Yeah. The longer you go, the more complex your function becomes. So more and more terms there. That's right. The longer you go, the more and more terms you have in your function. <laughs> right. And then it seems like, is there something at some point you can start saying, OK, how can we simplify this or stuff like pruning out pieces that aren't necessary? Right. That's, a, that's an excellent point. So can you prune out uh, unnecessary terms from our function? Uh, and the answer is yes. You could, for example, um, try pruning out some terms and test on a holdout set whether it changed the, um, changed the performance. Uh, 
Uh, that's, you know, that's like the next level of advanced after, uh, after getting the kernel perceptron to work in the first place. Or you could wait two lectures and we'll go to something called a support vector machine, which is going to optimize the representation of the function directly. Yes? For example, for those radio, radial basis gifts and all them, um, they're only parameterized by the Right, so you get a different, the question is, uh, for a Gaussian, can, are there other things you can adjust besides the argument that, you know, the x prime, the x and the x prime, the center and the point you evaluated at? And yeah, you can change the width of it, right? You can change the sigma, uh, which is the, the width of the kernel. Um, and you get a different reproducing kernel Hilbert space every time you change the sigma. Right, uh, and what that means is that you have a different um, inductive bias. Right, your perceptron is going to generalize differently. If you have a really wide set of kernel functions, then uh, every time you make a mistake, you'll make a big wide change to your discriminant function. If you have a very narrow kernel, then every time you make a mistake, you'll make a tiny little narrow change to your kernel function. <clears throat> And so in the first case, your discriminant is going to wind up being a big, sweeping, smooth function that sort of goes over all of your space, right? And in the other case, it's going to be a very wiggly function, right? And so you might have a prior belief about whether your, fun your discriminant function should be smooth or wiggly. Uh, and so you can choose the kernel width because of that. And if you choose it to be very narrow, you'll get very wiggly functions, which intuitively seem more complex, and you'll need more training data to fit them. Yep, right. You could have, uh, you could make, um, I'll talk about kernel combination, not this lecture, but later. Uh, and yes, you can make uh, something that mixes between kernels of different widths. And that's a good idea, right? Because if you're not sure what the um, spatial scale of your function is, you might want your algorithm to pick it for you. No, kernels do not have to be continuous. Um, and in fact, you can define kernels over discrete spaces uh, where continuity doesn't really have much of a meaning. Um, however, if you do have continuous kernels, it gives you some nice properties that let you do uh, other fancy things. So continuity is an important property of kernels, but it's not required. Okay. Did I see other hands up? Yeah. Does kernel have to be symmetric? Yes, right. So the two assumptions we made about a kernel are that it's symmetric and that it's positive type, meaning that if you make this matrix of kernel, it's uh, positive semi-definite. What does that reproducing mean? Uh, right, that was the one where I thought the definition, the, it's, it doesn't mean really much that's very important as far as I can tell. Um, no, um, it means, so uh, if you were to go uh, look at something called the Reese representation theorem. You would be able to take the inner product and turn it back into a kernel. And so you'd be able to reproduce the kernel from the, from the inner product in the same way that we defined the inner product from the kernel. So reproducing just means you can you know, take your kernel, go and define your inner product from it, then throw away the kernel and you can reproduce it from the inner product, right? Um, but in order to explain why that's true, you would need this thing called the Reese representation theorem. So hopefully that convinced you that it was a good idea to leave it out. I don't know. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, there was one more. I thought I saw one more hand up. All right, cool. So now what? Um, now let's take a at the kernel perceptron. And it turns out that after all this effort, the proof is actually textually identical to the proof that it was before. So you guys should all be completely familiar with this proof, but we're going to be interpreting it a little bit differently. Uh, and so it'll be, uh, it'll be you know, hopefully not boring. Um, so the kernel perceptron, if you uh, recall, was that on every mistake, you took uh, your uh, um, discriminant function and you added to it this term ui which was equal to yi times uh, the kernel evaluated at xi, right? Uh, and so the proof that this works 
uh, is going to be exactly the same. In particular, it's going to be based on the idea of a margin, right? And so uh, for the margin, right, we're going to have this same, um, same thing. We're going to assume that there exists an optimal um, discriminant function f star, where f star of ui, which as, as you recall, that's just the dot product between uh, ui and f star, right? Uh, sorry, between uh, k sub ui, right? And this should be k as well. No, I'm sorry, ui is already a k. Um, the dot product between ui and f star has to be bigger than or equal to one, right? So textually that's the same, right? The dot product between your optimal parameter and your, um, uh, and your point has to be bigger than or equal to one. But here what that means is that we're taking, um, right, uh, yeah, it means that we're taking the optimal, uh, the optimal discriminant function and evaluating it at a point, right? Um, and uh, we're going to say then that the norm of S star is equal to some constant W, right? And we're going to define the margin, uh, then 1 over W is equal to gamma the margin. Right? And that we're going to say that the margin, just like before, is 1 over the norm of the optimal discriminant function. And what does that mean? Uh, that means exactly the same thing that it did before. If we make a change to a given example, right? if we make a change to UI that has norm less than gamma, we're guaranteed to keep classifying it correctly. So visually what that means is if we take the um, uh, if we take an example xi and we look at its kernel function and another example xi prime and look at its kernel function, right? And if we, those two kernel functions, the norm of their difference isn't too big, right? Then we're going to still classify the example correctly, right? So it means basically that according to our definition of similarity, we can move all of our examples by a distance gamma uh, and still have them correctly classified. Okay. Um, so, uh, right, so we have these, these same assumptions that we had before, right? Uh, and now I'm going to do exactly the same proof, right? It's going to be in terms of two quantities, uh, the dot product between our discriminant and itself and the dot product between our discriminant and the optimal discriminant, right? And so on a mistake, um, let's do this one first, right? F nu comma F nu, right? Is equal to um, F dot F plus two UI dot F uh, plus uh, UI dot UI, right? And this was assumed to be less than or equal to one, right? And this, because it was a mistake, right, this is less than or equal to zero, right? So then the whole thing uh, is less than or equal to what it was, f dot f plus one, right? And so after m mistakes, we get that f inner product with itself uh, is less than or equal to m. Right? And that is exactly like it was in the previous proof, except that now our parameter vector is a whole function instead of just being an ordinary, like, finite dimensional parameter vector. Right? And then same thing over here, f dot f star. So if we have f nu uh, dot with f star, that's equal to um, ui dot with f star. Uh, plus f uh, dot with f star, right? Uh, and so um, we know that ui dot f star is, this has been assumed to be at least one, right? So this is greater than or equal to the old value f dot f star plus one. And after m mistakes, 
right? It, is, it implies that f dot f star is greater than or equal to m. Again, exactly like it was in the finite dimensional case, but now here, instead of the dot product, we have the inner product uh, in this uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space, right? And then, just like before, we can just chain these together, right? So uh, m is less than or equal to f inner product with f star, right? Which is by Cauchy-Schwartz less than or equal to the norm of f times the norm of f star, right? Uh, which is less than or equal to, right? The norm of f is less than or equal to the square root of m. Uh, and uh, the norm of f star was assumed to be w. And so just like before, we have that m is less than the square root of mw. And therefore, uh, m is less than or equal to w uh, squared. Right? And so just like before, in this is the linearly separable case or the uh, non-linearly separable case now that we're in the, um, in the function space. Uh, if we are separable with margin 1 over w, then we can make no more than w squared mistakes. Right? So everybody is now uh, happy with this proof, right? You've seen it a bunch of times in various incarnations. Right? And it's kind of mind-blowing that the exact same proof still works in this infinite dimensional function space. At least it blew my mind when I first saw it. Your mind. And um, the thing that blew my mind, right, is that the only thing that we had to assume was that this kernel function was symmetric and positive type, right? And from that, we got the ability to do this infinite dimensional optimization using a dirt simple algorithm. Okay. So, so where do we want to go now? Um, the, uh, the next thing I want to talk about um, just briefly, so we're going to go into um, more on uh, next class, which is next Monday, we're going to go into more detail about different algorithms that you can do using these kernels. Um, so always, you know, it's having one example is good. Having two examples allows you to start to do machine learning. Um, and so, but, and, but before then, I wanted to mention uh, just a few examples of kernels that you might see in practice, right? So uh, I guess call it like a rogues gallery of kernels. Um, the, uh, the first thing is uh, if you just have, if you're in the sort of usual machine learning sense of having a d-dimensional real valued feature space, there are a few kernels you can use, right? So um, if you have x is in rd, right, you can say that uh, k of x, x prime is equal just to x dot x prime. Um, Right, that gives you the ordinary one. That's called the linear kernel. Uh, we already saw the uh, k of x, x prime is equal to e to the uh, x minus x prime uh, norm squared over 2 sigma squared, right? The Gaussian RBF kernel, uh, where sigma here is a parameter. Um, we can also do um, k of x x prime is equal to um, 1 plus x dot x prime to the d. OK, why would we do that? Um, so if you, uh, if you expand this out, um, right, this is equal to uh, 1 plus the sum over all components i of x i x i x prime i right, to the d. And so if you expand that out, that is a polynomial. Let's say we consider um, uh, x to be fixed. That's a polynomial of dth order in x prime. right? Uh, and it turns out that you can get all polynomials of dth order by picking uh, over x prime by picking a bunch of different x's. 
and summing them together. So this is called the polynomial kernel of order d. And what it lets you do is let your discriminant function be a dth order polynomial. Right? Um, and so this is nice. Uh, it doesn't give you uh, an infinite dimensional function space because polynomials up to order d have a finite basis. But what it does let you do is, uh, let's say you want a hundredth order polynomial for whatever reason, right? How many, um, uh, how many dimensions uh, do we have here, right? Well, let's see, we have uh, 10 features, right? How many different ways are there to choose 10 features with repetition to make a hundredth order polynomial? Uh, I'm not going to calculate it, but the answer is lots, right? So uh, you can have a really big dimensional feature space, and you can handle it this way much, much more efficiently, right, by using these kernels, right? So the kernels, uh, they're required when you're trying to deal with infinite dimensional feature spaces, but for finite dimensional feature spaces, they can make things much more efficient, right? Um, but what's really cool uh, is that, um, if your, feature, if your examples don't come nicely featureized, right? Suppose they're strings of text like an email, or suppose that they're um, parse trees of a natural language sentence, right? Or suppose that they're images where there are features, but each feature is pretty useless, right? Pixel values are not very import, uh, informative on their own. So you can make kernels that make all of these things, uh, I mean, different kernel for each one, that makes each one of these things uh, interpretable, makes it uh, make sense to the machine learning algorithm. And so then you can run a kernel perceptron, for example, on strings of text. Uh, and what these kernels look like, um, I don't think we have time to uh, describe them right now, but uh, for example, for strings, a common kernel is based on the edit distance between strings. Right? And so the inner product between two strings is uh, large, uh, basically it's, it's uh, w the way you do it is you count the number of shared substrings between the strings. And that's going to be large if the ed edit distance is small, uh, and small if the edit distance is large. And you can turn that into, uh, into an inner product. Right? And you can do the same thing for trees, sets, and other even weirder and more wonderful data structures. All right. So uh, in addition to all of the advantages that I said so far right, of dealing with infinite dimensional function spaces, it lets us deal with types of data that we otherwise would have a great amount of difficulty turning into features. All right. So questions on kernels so far? You're right, it is e to the minus. Thank you. I hope that's the only mistake in these slides. All right, um, I think let's stop there and uh, we'll continue on Monday.